Joining us now from Canada is Alex. Welcome to the show, Alex. How are you? Very good, Donna. Great to be here with you. Yes. One of the things that I learned about when we were talking on the phone uh, most recently is the fact that you are the parent of a special needs individual and that because of that, it spurred your interest in the euthanasia situation. Walk us through that if you could, Alex. So I've been doing this uh, uh, work opposing euthanasia and assisted suicide since the 1990s. So it's been a long time. And we have a son who is autistic. And my wife and I were getting involved with the um, autism community. We were involved because obviously there was different, uh, how would you say, services, groups getting together, things like that. But we were getting involved with the uh, disability side of things that we, we became aware of a very different attitude that existed within the culture towards people with disabilities than other able-bodied people. And so, you know, this issue of euthanasia was being discussed already at that time. So we had a case in Canada in 1993 of Robert Latimer, who killed his daughter, Tracy, who has cerebral palsy. And uh, he, um, he ended up going through the courts. He ended up being convicted. But at the time, he was arguing that um, it was a force majeure. He said, uh, you know, she, she, I had no choice. Uh, this was the best option for her that uh, he caused her death. And in fact, of course, uh, I, I understood this concept that he might be going through a difficult time. The concept that it was okay to kill his daughter uh, was beyond what I would ever consider acceptable. Uh, and there was some polling that was done in Canada around his trial, and it showed that over 30% of Canadians thought that what Robert Latimer did was fine, that he was just a loving father. Uh, you know, maybe it wasn't the best response, but it was he was a loving father, and he felt he had no choice, and maybe this was the right thing to do. And it sort of shocked me, and this is what got me involved in the whole question of euthanasia. So th there was that part of it, and the other part of it that it was being debated in Canada, and there was very few people willing to talk about it. And I thought... You got to be kidding! You know this is a this is a very serious topic for people with disabilities, but also for people in general at a vulnerable time in their life. So, what is it that you set out to do? Are, did you set out to do some legislation, Alex? Like um, write a book? What steps did you take as a parent of someone uh, that was facing these challenges to be able to help others? Well, it's interesting you say that we started the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition. There was a group of people who got together to do that. And it, it's sort of like a one-stop sort of place. We are involved with education. We're involved with legislation. We're involved with health services, et cetera. Uh, but uh, primarily, um, our goal at that time was to maintain the current laws. Is at the time, euthanasia, assisted suicide were illegal in Canada. At the time, uh, our laws were perfectly good and fine. In fact, Robert Latimer was convicted uh, the attitude of the culture is what concerned me, not the fact that he he uh, might not get convicted. He was convicted. He did go to jail for killing his daughter. And I think that was the right right answer in that situation. You know, you just can't be killing a vulnerable person and getting away with this. Uh, nonetheless, um, uh, I did videos. We got involved with a lot of speaking. I, I've, I, you know, but we, we built an organization of supporters, people who agreed with us. And our goal from the beginning was to have you know, the average person getting involved. So, you know, when you're building an organization, you know, there's two ways that people tend to do it. They either look for that great big donor, the one with the deep pockets, and they find a few of those and then they do their work. But for me, it was like, no, we're trying to try and have mom and pop work with us. We're going to try and make it very easy for people to join our organization and be part of it. And I think that was a winning formula because we have thousands and thousands involved. We have over 60,000 email contacts. We've got thousands and thousands of members. And the, the reason we were able to do that is that we were, you know, looking for just the average person to get involved with opposing euthanasia and assisted suicide. And what you're, what you're most fearful about, which I was trying to understand your position, is that you're fearful that uh, people in the medical profession will just randomly, like, off people. Is that correct? Is that what your biggest fear is? is that well, is. <laughs> Well, that does happen. The problem is, is once you legalize this, you can't actually 
it's hard to figure out when that's happening and when that's not happening. We know in the U.S., for instance, and in Canada, there are, you know, people who will complain about, you know, my mother died and it just seemed to be like the person came in and they gave them this overdose of something and then suddenly she died. And, and how could that have happened? How could this be happening? So you do hear of that. So that's what you would call, you know, abuse of drugs that are occurring in order to speed up a death, make it happen quickly. But in the case of legalizing it, um, the fact is, is that the outcome in Canada is exactly what I was concerned about from the beginning. First of all, I'm opposed to killing people. I think it's just a bad idea to give your doctor the right in law to kill you. I, I think that's just a terrible idea. On top of it, I can understand the feelings why someone would think that way, because obviously none of us want to suffer. I don't want to suffer. I don't want you to suffer. I've got no interest in your suffering. But the fact of it is, is uh, to give someone that power is a very dangerous thing. So what we now have seen in Canada is that uh, once we legalized euthanasia, we first had a terminal illness sort of requirement to it. So that sort of kept it a little bit controlled in a sense. Uh, but then they got rid of that in 2021. So now you need to have an irremediable medical condition. So you might have noticed out of Canada, we're having quite a few stories now of people who are people with disabilities who are living in poverty, people with disabilities who are experiencing homelessness or in fear of becoming homeless because let's say they, they live in an apartment and the uh, owner of the building is going to uh, redo the building. So everyone has to leave and, and they're on a set, uh, a set income because of their disability pensions, et cetera, their disability, meaning it's very hard to find a place to live. We've, we've had people who are saying, I can't find medical treatment. I can't seem to get the medical treatment I need, but I'm approved for made medical aid and dying i'm approved for euthanasia so they're going that road and we've had quite a few of these cases we had a case in mississauga of a food bank the woman running the food bank who came went to the media saying uh there's a serious problem here uh, we have people who are coming to the food bank who are talking about medical aid and dying euthanasia they're talking about this because they're saying i can't continue living this way so what you have is uh once you allow euthanasia killing and you sell it, of course, as eliminating suffering. The end result is you're also then within that group of people uh, having the social reasons for killing. Okay. That has become Thank prevalent. Thank you. So it's a um, serious you, problem. When we uh, first joined the call, one of the things you said is that something good, though, for you recently happened. What was that? You said you have a little bit of good news uh, for your efforts. Oh, well, there, there has been quite a few cases recently of people who have contacted us. I'm not sure exactly what we were doing, because I have to remember what our context was in that conversation. But we've had quite a few people. We also have a help service that we offer, people contacting us, talking to us. So there's been quite a few cases of people who have contacted us, and they really feel that their life is lack, lacking of meaning and value and purpose. They've come to a point in their life uh, they might have a significant medical condition. Uh, they might be experiencing, um, you know, psychological issues along with that, which is not uncommon. Like, think about what it means to be human and our, our, us experiencing, you know, these difficult medical conditions, whether it be disability or whether it be a chronic case or a terminal case. And they're, they're contacting us and we're, and, um, and we've been able to help quite a few people and uh, they, they end up dying a natural death. But the reality is, is, the biggest thing of this whole thing of people contacting us who are seeking death or who have already been approved for medical aid and dying euthanasia is that you actually find out why people are asking for this. There are some people mm. who ask to have their life ended because they are like these radical autonomists and they see it as I like to plan. I, I like to die on my birthday, you know, so I'm going to plan my death and I'm going to die on July 5th or whatever it is. And that's my big goal in life. And this, you know, there are some people like that, but that's not the majority of people. The majority of people are going through a difficult time in their life, and they have come to a point where they really feel like they've lost meaning and purpose and value. There's no one visiting them. There's no friends in their life anymore. Maybe they, uh, they have a type of a condition which makes it impossible for them to go out, so they're having a difficulty getting out. They might have uh, different issues around uh, their health. They might have some early dementia going on. And they're alone, they're lonely, they're lacking meaning, purpose, or value. These are not reasons to kill anybody, no matter how you look at it, but this has become the reality. And so your organization So a helps, lot of people have been helped. Help, help, help with those calls. So it's a place to call, well, a we, place to, for support and understanding. Absolutely, yes. And the biggest thing Thank you do you. when someone's contacting that the helpline is, is you listen. Because a lot of people have nobody in their life. And you're thinking... Well, how could we have this situation where they have nobody in their life and they'd rather be dead? And sadly, um, you probably have noticed it. There's a lot of loneliness in our culture. There's a lot of people who are going through difficult situations 
And once death becomes an option, they start thinking that that's the better way out. To me, that's very sad. That is a very sad situation indeed, uh, because what most of these people actually need is someone who actually cares about them, who's a friend. That's what they need. They need someone in their life. I couldn't agree more. I appreciate you being on today. And yes, mental health and awareness and suicide prevention, or as you were saying, um, medically assisted euthanasia, it's, it's, um, it's something definitely that few people talk about, but I love the fact that you were able to create this platform for people and, and a way for people to you know, have a discussion and get help and be less lonely. So thank you very thank much you, for Donna. joining us today. It's a pleasure to see you once again. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye.